uh, as agreed by our speaker. Uh, so uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to our webinar this week. Uh, this week we have Sarah Meher speaking with us from Scripps Institution of Oceanography. Uh, Sarah uh, actually was originally from Idaho, <laughs> as um, in my, I just knew uh, two minutes ago. Uh, so she went to Victoria for undergraduate uh, undergraduate study in astronomy and physics, which I was also just new recently. And then she went to University of Hawaii for her master's before she pursued her PhD research um, at the Scripps Institution of, Ocean of Oceanography. So today she's going to present the work. I think that covers a significant proportion of her work at her PhD at the Scripps. Um, uh, 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 and actually, the, the video that she's showing her background was part of the field work that for the uh, autonomous uh, RV uh, collecting samples. So it's a combination of the petrology and the geomagnetic studies. And actually, it has a quite important implication for geodynamics too, to me, uh, because it basically constrains the uh, thermal uh, map or, or, or the thermal uh, process. Uh, in the Earth's uh, lower ocean crust, I think in, in general, in the crust in general. So with that, uh, let's give the rest of time for Sarah to present her work. And uh, normally we, our speakers speak for about 45 minutes or so, and then we leave about 10 to 15 minutes for interaction with our participants. So with that, Sarah, please. All right, thank you guys so much for having me. I'm really excited to show the research that I did during my PhD and uh, hopefully, Please let me know if you have any questions. Feel I, I can see you in the chat. So ask something in the chat or raise your hand. Feel free to interrupt me because I know not everybody does. It, this looks like a really diverse um, seminar. So it, it, feel free to interrupt so we can all kind of have the same baseline. I know magnetics might not be everybody's bag, but it's, it's what I do. So, <laughs> but anyway, yeah. So this is a video or a picture of just how flat it was out in the South Pacific when I got to go uh, do this research. And this was a 35 day cruise and we collected a lot of new magnetic data that really tells us a lot about how the lower ocean crust cools, which is a really uh, neat, much needed constraint in earth sciences. So uh, hopefully we can all learn a little bit together about it. So I, I like starting my talks with this because it's really been a motivating factor in, in a lot of the science that I do, it, it, which is plate tectonic reconstructions. And I really think that it's one of the most interesting things about science. It's one of the most recent sciences, uh, really only developed in the, in the 1950s, 1960s. And a lot of it is constrained by paleomagnetic data, which I thought was really interesting. So learning how these plates move in the past and especially um, information from the ocean crust is really the final frontier in terms of, of things that we can learn in earth sciences. So I was really compelled to try and learn more about how we're getting this paleomagnetic data, what we can use, how we can use it to constrain information about the earth and, and just, just how it works in terms of from collection to a data point to interpolation, uh, what, what goes into it. So that was really a motivating factor for me to come to Scripps and learn, learn about this. And so for some of you that might not be as familiar, uh, we we really use magnetics as a constraint because it tells us a lot about the age of the crust. And for people that might not be as familiar with how, how magnetics can be recorded in the ocean crust, I have a little video of what that looks like. So you can imagine that this orange material is a, is a molten magma, and we're going to have little needle-like grains of magnetite growing as the temperature cools. Um, and at, at, over time, those needle-like grains will be able to acquire a magnetic moment. And that's gonna be represented by a little red uh, arrow. And you'll see over time how they'll try and align with the present day field, which is this blue arrow line. So here they are growing and below a certain temperature, they, they can easily flip their magnetic moment, but over time it becomes, and as things cool, it becomes more and more difficult for the moment to flip. And then as we reach below a certain temperature, everyone has locked in a magnetic moment. And you can see not all of them are pointing directly aligned with the field, but the majority statistically will align with the field. And the stronger the field is, the more likely things are to align with it. 
And so generally, uh, any kind of material like oceanic crust that has these magnetites will be able to record the overarching field of that, of that time period. And unless we're heating it up or altering it, it will maintain that field. And so our, our current magnetic field is pointing north, but that hasn't always been true. It's actually pointed south for long periods of time. And that pattern of normal and reverse polarity is actually recorded in the seafloor. So then if you're a research vessel or a cruise ship looking uh, in World War II for, for submarines, you can actually um, tow a magnetometer behind you and see this magnetic field represented as an anomaly pattern, which is this uh, just pattern of normal and reverse uh, magnetic anomalies that can be seen. And because we know what this pattern looks like and it's tightly cons constrained to a time period, we can actually use it to tell us something about the age of the seafloor. So that's one of the main ways that we, through plate tectonics, knew how these plates moved in the past and information just about how fast they're moving and the, and the time period that things were cooling in. And so for example, close to me on the East Pacific rise, things are uh, moving very fast. The, plate, the plates are um, in a very fast spread fast spreading environment versus something like um, south of Africa where things are moving much more slowly. So we really focused in on this study uh, looking at fast spread crust like the East Pacific rise where things are a lot more um, consistent in terms of the structure of the lower crust and we want to understand the how that lower crust is formed. So just as a little idea, in fast spread crust, we actually have a very um, predictable set of layering within the crust called the Penrose model that's come from limited sampling that we have directly from the ocean and then things that have been abducted, pushed onto land, ocean crust that's been pushed onto land. We can examine that and get a general idea of what the structure looks like. So I have a picture generally on top, we'll have these beautiful pillow lavas. I do wanna mention all of these pictures came from our cruise to Pitot Deep. So these are all things that we've seen while we were at sea. Um, and then sheeted dikes, which are uh, cooled relatively quickly. But then we also have this uppermost section of gabbros. And while we have a good idea of how lavas and dikes are formed and cooled over time, we don't have much information about the lower structure of the crust in the, in the gabbroic layer. Uh, so that was one of the motivating factors for doing this study, because it will tell us a lot in terms of the thermal structure of the crust, where we expect to um, form things, how things are formed, and, and it has huge implications both in the lithosphere and the asthenosphere, um, what we should be seeing. So, so it was a very important thing to start looking at in this, in this kind of exposure. And the reason uh, that we have such limited, well, we have very limited exposures and limited data. And that has led to two different models of how we think the lower crust is formed. So this is just a schematic that we have of, of the two different models. And so again, we have our, our lavas and dikes and we have a pretty good idea of how those are being formed and cooled. And then the question is what's happening in this gabbroic layer? So we've seen from seismic surveys of, of um, spreading centers that there's this axial magma lens, this, this uh, Red represented by this red magmatic feature. It's generally very small. It's only one to two kilometers wide, maybe 100 to 500 meters thick, and it exists about one kilometer below the spreading center. We've seismically imaged that, and we can generally agree that that exists. The question is, what's happening below that axial magma lens? And there's lots of different lines of evidence, but some, but they've led to these two different models. And so for the mini sills model or a sheeted sills model, we're saying that axial magma lens exists, but there's also several smaller lenses that are existing throughout the crust, pretty much down to the mantle level, to the moho level. And that's producing all of the crust in situ. And that has different implications in terms of the 
the magmatic features you'd see, the geochemistry, um, even the seismology of the of the area. And one and one interesting feature of this is if these sills exist, um, but we can't see them off axis, then things have to be very cooling very quickly within one to two kilometers of the crust of the spreading center, excuse me. So something has to happen within one to two kilometers. And people generally think that's due to deep hydrothermal circulation. So cracks within the crust are allowing water to come in and, and cool this deep gabbroic layer very quickly. The other option is that we don't have these uh, lenses throughout the crust, but perhaps the axial magma lens is producing the majority of the lower crust. Things are being formed and crystallized within the axial magma lens and then being moved down and away. And that again has huge implications for the, the fabrics that we'd see in rocks and, and other things like cooling rates. Um, but the key thing that we're looking at is this temperature idea. So where before we we're cooling things very quickly due to deep hydrothermal circulation, in this other model, we would actually lose the majority of our, our heat through the top of the axial magma lens close to the spreading center. And then off axis, we're going to have things cool much more slowly, perhaps conductively off axis. And so in this model where things are cooling very quickly, we, this is representing an isotherm, which is a, a line of constant temperature. And we'd expect those to be very steep. So we'd have just very quick, abrupt cooling versus this other model where we have things cooling very slowly, which would be represented by much more shallow, perhaps conductively, uh, conductively shaped isotherms. And so that's the key focus, uh, or that's the key difference between these two models that we'll be focusing on. And luckily, we can actually use polarity boundaries from magnetics to identify those differences because they act as uh, proxies for these polarity. Um, they act as proxies for this type of uh, boundary because they're all cooling at the same temperature. So where, again, you'd have a sheeted sills model or a mini sills model, you would expect steep changes between polarity boundaries. Or in a Gabbro glacier model, you might expect things to be cooling uh, much more slowly, and you would see much more shallow boundaries between polarity intervals. So it's an interesting way to look at it. And if we can actually see exposures within the crust, the shape of that polarity boundary should be telling us something about how it cools. And just for reference throughout this talk, I am going to use uh, red to represent a normal polarity, like the present day field, and the blue will be a reverse polarity, like a, a field pointing to the South Pole. All right, and so the shape of those boundaries took me a very long time to understand, so I made a little schematic to hopefully help everybody else also understand what they, what they might be looking at. So let's go back and imagine that we're just looking at a column of the gabbroic layer that's still very hot, represented by this orange magma-ish looking color. And then because the dikes cool much more quickly, they're already, um, they're already cool and they've recorded whatever, whatever the field was at that time. So you can imagine that it's cooling in a present day field. And then I have two different ways of kind of representing that. This is an equal area plot that will show whether it's normal or reverse. And this is just kind of a, a compass diagram that will show uh, the magnitude of, of a sample recording at that level. So you can imagine that things are cooling from the top down. And we're just going to walk through what kind of magnetization we would expect in the crust at that time period. So it's cooling from the top. And as we're cooling, you can imagine that it's going to an acquire and a magnetization in the same direction as the field. So you'd have a little normal direction. Everything below it has not gained the ability to acquire a magnetization. It's too hot, so it won't record anything. Then as time goes on, we're still cooling from the top down. We might gain more magnetization at the topmost level, and now it's lost all ability to record anything. It's cooled, we can't do anything with it anymore. 
and this middle level has just started to acquire a normal magnetization. So if the field flips, then it, at lower temperatures, it's going to record a reversely magnetized field. So this is called a multi-component sample. It's actually really important for my research. And when you see something like that, you should immediately think that things are cooling very slowly because it's had to have cooled over two polarity intervals. And these polarity intervals are, um, they can be up to 100,000 years in, in this time period. Uh, but overall, it's just representing very slow cooling. So that's really important. So let's keep cooling down the column. You can imagine that we continue to record a reversely magnetized field, and then things at a certain level have stopped gaining the ability to record. At lower temperatures, everything's blocked. And then finally, if we reverse the field again, you would see a, a normal overprint. So you can see that you'd expect a pattern of normal, normal with reverse overprint, reverse, reverse with normal overprint in, in any kind of samples that we could collect. And then if you looked at the magnetization of the seafloor, what you might expect to see is normally magnetized samples overlaying reversely magnetized samples and maybe just a hint of normal at the very bottom here. So that's kind of an example for a, something that's cooled very slowly. If things are cooling very quickly, however, I think it's a lot more intuitive in terms of everything's cooling at once, everything acquires the same magnetization, and there's no ability for these samples to acquire any kind of multi-components or overprint. And then everything would be magnetized in the same direction. So where with slow cooling, you might expect striped patterns throughout the crust, with a, with a quick cooling at some level, there, there will be columns of normal and reverse existing throughout the crust. Okay, so now we have some expectations of what we might see with magnetics. So let's actually look at what the study area looks like. So I've had the opportunity to go on this 35 day cruise to Pitot Deep, which is off the coast of, well, it's off the coast of the Easter microplate. And we did get to go to Easter Island, which was very cool. Uh, and it's a very unique area. There's only three places we know on Earth where we can see, where we can expect to see exposures of the gabbroic crust in fast spread crust. And this is one of three places. So that was really cool. And it's also one of the only places where the polarity boundaries could potentially be exposed. And the reason we know that is we've actually, um, oh, this is a movie that we actually made digitizing um, a paper that looked at the polarity uh, of the crust near Pito Deep. And it actually shows how the Easter microplate formed and exposed the deep. So these uh, red lines actually represent the spreading center in map view. So what you're seeing is um, new crust being formed and moving away from the spreading center. And then this propagating ridge is actually going to help the opening of the Easter microplate and will create a clockwise rotation that's allowing this microplate to form. And this has caused deep exposures into fast spread crust, which is again, very rare. A lot of these exposures are at microplates like this. And so um, all of the polarity boundaries recorded in, in the Gauss, which is a magnetic polarity interval are, are being represented. And then, yeah, in the northwest corner here is where the pitot deep is being formed and where our study area is. So just a red box to highlight that region that we're interested in. And then we went and did um, more detailed bathymetry surveys. So this is showing um, the deep here. It's reaching about 6,000 meters depth in, in the crust. And then we also did some sea surface surveys. So we towed magnetometers behind the ship and combined it with other data. And that allowed us to determine the magnetization of the crust. And you can see that there's this barcode pattern again that we can tie to age. What, you, what I would like you to notice is that um, the East Pacific rise is pretty oriented north-south, but you can see that these polarity boundaries are tilted 40, uh, 20 degrees up to the northeast, excuse me, up to about 45 degrees within our study area. And that has a lot to do with the rotation 
inflammation caused by the Easter microplate. The Easter microplate you can see here, and then the, the Pacific plate is on the other side. So that rotation has actually bent the polarity boundaries and we know what that rotation is. It's an, it's an expected rotation that we actually see in our magnetization directions. All right, so just to highlight, we have a really unique area that's a very deep exposure into crust. And this is um, about two kilometers of in situ lavas overlaying dikes, overlaying the uppermost gabbroic layer of crust. And previous sampling has actually allowed us to get a lot of information. So we have information from near bottom magnetic anomaly data. So just as we towed a ship to get magnetometer data, we have three different ways that we've collected anomaly data very close to the seafloor. JSON, which is actually collecting samples like the one behind me, um, has magnetometer data that we've incorporated. And then also there was a DSL-120 uh, AUV, I believe, that was towed in 2005. And that was towed about 80 meters above the seafloor to collect magnetic anomaly data. And then on our cruise in 2012, we have these very in-depth um, surveys using Sentry which allows us to create these really detailed swaths of uh, magnetization and hopefully to identify the exact location of the polarity boundary at depth. We also have information directly from rock samples. So in 2005, they primarily sampled the lavas and dikes and just a few gabbros, but it's really helped to identify the boundaries of these uh, layers within the crust. And then our crews actually went in and densely sampled the gabbroic layer. So you can see we collected over 400 samples and I'm going to focus in on this area called area B where we've collected over 300 samples in one area. So just focusing in on that area, this white box is a one by one kilometer area where we collected over 300 samples and over 70% of those samples have some level of orientation, which is really important for our magnetic studies because if I know how this rock is oriented, I can learn how the magnetic field is oriented from that rock. So without that information, I can't, I can't um, use direct sampling to tell us anything about the magnetic field direction. And this is really interesting. Before we went to this, before we did this study, there was less of this kind of oriented gabbroic rock than we had moon rock. And now we have over two tons. So it's a really detailed study and it's really important to do a continental style study of this. So I don't know if you are familiar with a place called um, Yosemite National Park, but there's this really famous outcrop called El Capitan. And they've actually done really beautiful surveys of, of this rock that tells us a lot about its geologic history. But if we were to sample this in the ocean, we would really only get one to three samples and that would tell us this whole history. So by being able to so densely sample this area, we were actually able to do a more continental style study that would tell us a lot more about how, how the lower crust is forming. Okay. So let's go back to that magnetic anomaly data. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, the sea surface anomaly data that I've just kind of lightly highlighted in the background here in this black box, which is our study area. We really focused in on two study areas with the near bottom anomaly data. And I'm just gonna show you the inversion solution for those. And what I hope you see is that they're actually very similar to the sea surface solution, which I guess isn't surprising, but it's, it's really adding confidence to our results where we expect to see two polarity intervals running through these study areas. And we're seeing a very similar result at both areas. And it's a really wide survey, which is, is really important to do. So let's focus in on a couple of these. So in area A, which is this um, Northwest study area, I've just highlighted it in a perspective view so it makes it easier to see. Um, what you can see here is that at the higher elevations, uh, we have a normal magnetization, while in lower elevations, we have a reverse magnetization. And this line is at a constant level of elevation, 
So it's essentially subhorizontal for about seven kilometers. And it turns out that that line also is heavily tied to the dike gabbro boundary. So the boundary between the uppermost or the dikes and the uppermost gabbros is essentially horizontal through this area from the limited sampling that we have. And it really corresponds to this. So this is a really interesting result. It essentially is saying that the dikes are differently magnetized than the gabbros and they have to be offset by a minimum of seven kilometers, which already is telling us that it can't be cooling quickly. If things are cooling quickly within one to two kilometers of the, of the spreading center, at some level here, we would need the dikes and gabbros to be magnetized in the same direction, but they're not. So this is really telling us that there is this huge offset that has to imply some kind of heat that is existing off axis um, based on magnetic results. So that's really compelling for slow cooling. And then if we look in this other region, uh, it's a little, again, we have this perspective view that can be a little hard to understand, but we do have a line of, again, constant elevation. And again, for a different time period, we see that things are normally magnetized at the top and reversely magnetized in the gabbro layer. Uh, we have more dense sampling in this region, and it does look, it's not quite at the dike gabbro boundary. It's about 200 meters below the dike gabbro boundary that this transition is existing, is happening. But again, it's nearly horizontal, and that's nearly horizontal for about eight kilometers off axis, where before it was six kilometers. So we are so we're showing these huge zones of, of hot regions that exist off axis for a long time period. So that's really compelling. It's telling us that there has to be um, this zone that exists that stay, remains hot, and it shouldn't be cooling quickly within one to two kilometers of the axis. And so that's really interesting. And that's from um, just the anomaly data. But I think anybody that works uh, with magnetic inversions or gravity inversions or inversions in general knows that there's these issues of uniqueness. So am I, am I using proper techniques? Is, is there some kind of uh, offset that I'm not accounting for? And the one thing that we can really use to verify our results is going to be this information from rock data. So that's actually really useful because if I, if I just, so this is just the sea surface bathymetry, or sorry, the sea surface magnetization, again, draped over our bathymetry. And you can see that this area where we've really densely sampled the gabbroic section actually corresponds to where we expect to see the polarity boundary running through our study area. So this is going to be a really compelling way to either verify our results or say that we're doing something wrong with our inversion technique. So I have this playing behind me, but this is, I, I just think it's really cool how they collected so much of this uh, rock sampling data. So I figured I would show you guys um, a little bit of it. But essentially this is an orientation tool that will tell you its exact orientation in space. So they put, there's more than this camera view but we'll have three cameras that will confirm that this is placed flat against the face of the rock. It'll tell you exactly how it's oriented and they're gonna grab it off of the seafloor. We also do this visually by using the location of this basket that's holding all of our samples. We know the orientation of that basket pretty well in space. So we have a really good idea of how the rock is facing. One thing we don't really know is the dip. How, how that rock is oriented in space. So that, that is a level of uncertainty that we do have in our measurements, but we've tried to account for it as well as we can. And I, I think the results will show that we've done a pretty good job of seeing that. And so once they collect this rock, they'll take it back on board ship and try and orient it based on all of this video and use little markings that uh, the collection tool has made on the rock to reorient it in space. It's done uh, very carefully on, on board ship. So we've collected all these samples. We've meticulously uh, reoriented them, figured out their exact orientation in space, cut them, looked at their geochemistry, their mineralogy, and then all of these rocks are sent to us at Scripps Institution of Oceanography, where I took them and cut them up and made them into magnetic samples. 
So what that looks like for me is we have all of these orientation measurements on it. I carefully preserve and record those orientation measurements and cut things into either cubes or cores to do our magnetic study. So here's just a couple examples of all of these little cubes that we did. Again, we have over 300 samples in just one specific area, but we'd often do test more than one uh, specimen from each sample just to make sure things are consistent. So for this group, I don't, I don't really want to uh, deep bore you with how, how we determine the magnetic direction. I'd be happy to talk about it a little bit more. But essentially what we're doing is we're going to heat up these samples that already have some kind of orientation they've locked in while they were cooling. And you can imagine as we're heating it up and then cooling it in a field, in no field, we're essentially erasing what was produced at a specific temperature. And if we know, what, know that vector that we've erased, if we can determine the vector we've erased, we get our magnetic direction overall. So that's essentially how we're determining an a magnetic direction. And we have these ovens that are very, um, very well calibrated and we'll do interval heating and cooling and measuring to determine with, with a great deal of accuracy, usually within um, five degree temperature steps, uh, the orientation of these samples. And we have, we have ways of presenting them for this purpose, for this talk, I'm definitely highlighting our interpretations of what these directions are. So I'll, I'll let you know what, what, what our interpretations are. And so, as you might expect in a place where we're expecting to see a polarity boundary, we do see samples that have a normal magnetization, samples that have a reverse magnetization, but then thir over 30% of our samples, or around 30% of our samples, show some level of multi-component samples, which again, full stop, means that we're seeing slow cooling. So, so that's a really compelling result already. Um, at some level, a lot of these show either high temperature normal with a low temperature reverse overprint or a high temperature reverse with a low temperature normal overprint at very specific temperature steps. Um, something that might not occur to you or but uh, I just wanted to highlight is that these aren't these directions again are not pointing directly to the present day field, which is represented by these little diamonds. If things were completely normal, they would expect to kind of cluster around this uh, and reverse would cluster around this. But we don't see that. We see this rotated direction. Um, this clustering does give me confidence that we've done a pretty good job of overall of orienting our samples. There, it's not perfect, there's going to be some scatter, but overall we've done a relatively good job of, of preserving uh, the overall direction of the rocks that we had initially. But if you see that this clustering is happening around this rotated direction, uh, that's actually not unexpected because if you remember, we know that something happened to rotate our samples initially. Um, and initially things were being formed north south and then a subsequent rotation. So this is actually really comforting when you see something that has a rotated direction that agrees with our general um, average rotated normal. We know that it was something that formed at or near the ridge and then was subsequently rotated. So it acquired its magnetization early on and it's not something that's due to like alteration or a present day field, which might be more suspect. Anything that has these rotated directions, we have a lot of confidence that this was something that happened early on close to the spreading center as the lower crust was forming. Okay, so that's, that's pretty much uh, all the information. Let's look at the results. So what we're seeing here is this region in area B that has over 300 samples. The little pluses represent any place where you collected a sample. And then I'm going to have all these little circles pop up that show the high temperature direction. They're colored according to how close they are to that normal and reverse average direction. So anything with a bolder color, we have more confidence that it's well oriented. Um, and then we'll just run through it real quick. 
So this is kind of how we collected them in real time was uh, picking them up. And you can see that some of these have little diamonds on them. That's representing their low temperature overprints. So if they're a multi-component sample, they'll have a diamond. And anything with a black diamond is a normal overprint and a white diamond is a reverse overprint. And then the background of this, I forgot to mention, is colored according to our inversion. So, so what I showed earlier, it's just the gridded version of the inversion in this area. Okay, and so this is a detailed version from the paper. And what we're seeing, hopefully what you can see overall, if you were just looking at the, at the circles in this picture, what I'd love for you to see is that at the top most areas of, of this region, it's red, it's normally magnetized. And at the bottom most part of the region, it's reverse. So at some level, we've actually captured this polarity boundary. And, that, and that's amazing to me. Like this is the first time and over a kilometer wide, we see this horizontal polarity boundary, both in our inversion and in our samples. So we're really confirming what these magnetic inversions are telling us and everything's telling us the same thing. You've got the polarity interval. It's pretty, it's pretty horizontal. So that's really cool. And then if we actually look at the pattern of normal and reverse polarity in the samples, that's also telling us a story. Um, we have this normal with reverse polarity overprint at the top, and then generally more reverse in the middle as a high temperature. And then at the very at the at the bottom most elevations that we have, we have reverse with a normal overprint. And so that's actually telling us a story of normal polarity, then reverse polarity, then normal polarity over again. So in this region, we're seeing the presence of over three polarity intervals that has to be slow cooling. So that, this is a really compelling result that's coming out and saying, this, this has to be very slow, something's happening. But what does that mean in terms of, uh, how the lower crust is forming. Uh, one thing before I, I talk about it, I wanna highlight here. Uh, so we have these, uh, again, multi-component samples. They show a remarkable consistency in terms of the range of temperatures that they're transitioning from normal to reverse or reverse to normal at. So in this, in this band of samples that show normal with reverse overprint, the average, um, temperature that they're transitioning at ranges from about 500 to 540 degrees C um, with a median value of about 530. And that can corresponds to in geologic times, a temperature of about 500 degrees C. So somehow this band is representing um, cooling at about 500 degrees C in the lower gabbroic crust. I want you to keep that in mind. So this is, I'm actually really proud of this schematic because we took a lot of information from the East Pacific rise and specifically from our study area at Pedo Deep. So everything you see from the bathymetry to the thickness of these uh, lavas, dikes, and gabbros has been determined by data, which, I, which took a long time, but very, very worth it. Um, so what you're essentially looking at is a snapshot in time for Pedo deep, which represents this really magmatically robust fast spread crust. And you can imagine that this is the time period right when it's switching from normal to a reverse uh, time period. And so that's already being reflected in the lavas and dikes. The white represents this reverse time period and it's already starting to record close to the spreading center this reversal. Um, if we take our data, and, and project it based on when this is cooling. Our data represents um, cooling about six kilometers off axis. And so at that time period, as things are cooling in the lavas and dikes uh, over here, we're just now getting cold enough, uh, cooling down enough to begin recording in the gabbros, six kilometers off axis. So that's a, that represents a huge amount of, of differential space between where things are cooling in the lavas and dikes and where things are cooling in the gabbros. And it's six kilometers off axis 
only about 200 meters below the Dyke Gabbro boundary. Um, and because we know the temperature that those transitioned at from the multi component samples, we can identify the isotherm that we're looking at, which is this black line, and that's about 500 degrees C. So this really is allowing us to create the schematic that's telling us what temperature regimes we're expecting in, in fast spread robust crust. Whoop. Uh, yeah, so I, I and it's and the thing that I think is most compelling is that it's actually effectively slower than conductive cooling. So where things essentially should be cooling very slowly, we usually say conductive, but it's cooling slower than conductive. We would expect things to be essentially horizontal for six to eight kilometers off axis. Eight kilometers if you include our um, information that we have from the magnetic surveys that we did, the anomaly surveys. And that's actually verified by a lot of data. So in, in the East Pacific rise, we see this presence of ephemeral off-axis magma lenses that exist six to eight kilometers off-axis. They've been imaged. And they don't exist for long periods of time, but they represent places where it has to be at least hot enough to support magma for, for an extended period of time. So it's a, it's a really compelling kind of result that, that implies that things are remaining hot off axis for much longer than people have thought in the past. And it definitely is incompatible with this conducted, with this type of cooling that would require cooling within one to two kilometers of the spreading center. If that were true, all of our samples should be normally magnetized and they're not. So that was really compelling to me. One of the speculative things that we, we published that I, that I would be curious to talk about a little more is that we've kind of hypothesized that it, it can't remain horizontal forever. And where we start to see downturns in isotherms, there, there must be some kind of influx that allows uh, cooling to occur. And we've hypothesized that there, there starts to be these um, deeper offset faults that occur about eight to 10 kilometers off axis at the East, that we see at the East Pacific rise and in these fast spread robust crusts. Um, that could be a place where faulting has allowed hydrothermal circulation to occur within the crust. And so that allows water to cool down this gabaroic crust and create a downturn in isotherms that we, we might see. So that could rectify some of these uh, different models and, and help explain why we're seeing uh, deep hydrothermal circulation in some samples. So yeah, overall, that's kind of the, the results that we got from the, this study. Uh, I think it's a really compelling result uh, from magnetic samples. And it, it's really been interesting to see how everything has combined together to, to tell this story that says things are cooling very slowly from a magnetic perspective. Um, how, that, how that's gonna uh, be looked at over time, I'm, I'm curious to see. Um, and one thing that I would really be interested in, in looking at is looking further off axis and seeing it, are we, would we expect to see more heat release off axis and, and what, what the future holds there. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, I, that's pretty much the story and I'd, I'd love to talk or answer questions about it <laughs> if you have any. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Now is time for questions from our participants. So feel free to open your mic or type a question in the chat and I could read the question on your behalf. So go ahead. Hi, Sarah. This is Ben from the University. And uh, 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 it's a cool and great job. And uh, my question is, uh, could you explain more about the principle that uh, if the rock have two failed direction, then uh, it has been through a slower cooling process? Yeah, I, I can try. So uh, <laughs> one thing I think that from a purely magnetic perspective that people were concerned about is, um, the idea that maybe that doesn't represent uh, 
cooling over time period, that represents alteration. And I think the rotation of our, or, or of our samples kind of shows that that's not true. But maybe just going through this again real quick would help. Um, so the idea is that as things are cooling, they're acquiring their magnetization. And so above specific temperatures, um, those, those, what's been acquired isn't going to be removed again. So if things are consistently being cooled down, the, once that magnetization is locked in, it's not going to disappear again uh, or be altered in any way. So, so I, I tried with this schematic um, to say, so for example, this one is locked in. And even though now the field turns to reverse, I can't, I can't alter this because it's all right. You can imagine it being completely cold and I, I can't, I can't magically heat it up unless there's some kind of source that happens outside of this. Um, but now, so anything that's being recorded where I have this potential to record within a very specific temperature range, which is below 580 and above uh, about 200 degrees C, um, that's the only range that I'm going to record any kind of magnetic information. If, I, if I'm above that, I can't do it. And if I'm below that, I can't do it again. Uh, yeah. And so the multi-component sample is only in, in this scenario that I pros, posed, uh, the multi-component sample is only going to happen during a polarity transition. And, and it has to be long enough to record both the normal and the reverse. And, and I don't know if I covered it well enough, so please let me know if I didn't. Uh, yes, and uh, how long did the failed direction uh, reversed? Uh, I mean, yeah. So there's there's some discussion about it. Um, it, it on a geologic time scale, it's it's relatively fast, but it's it's about ten thousand years uh, to to record this kind of switch between normal and reverse. Um, there is some work that we're thinking about doing because to, I, I'm, I'm poorly drawing it in this sketch, but essentially you would have a strong magnetic north and at some point the field essentially has to disappear for it to turn to south. So you're losing intensity in the field and that might not record very well. Um, and I think in a couple of figures and especially for the temperature steps that we're looking at, um, that can kind of be shown by this clustering that happens in the polarity. Sometimes we get a little clustering here, which means maybe at certain temperature steps, it's staying there for a little while. The, the, we're not getting too much of a change in direction when, when the temperature is still changing. Okay. Okay, got it. Thank you. Yeah. Ask a question, please. Hello. Hello. Uh, hi. I, hey, Zhangzhou. Uh, hi, Zhangzhou. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead, Zhangzhou Xia uh, from I, Kaohsiung University. Go ahead. Okay. Hi, Dr. Ma. Uh, Dr. Ma, I have a question about this picture. Um, so you see that the reverse direction is uh, applied during cooling. So uh, do you have make some uh, check? Do, do, do you have make some check to confirm that this Reverse direction is primary, not secondary. That's a good question. Um, yeah. So again, I think the big uh, reason that we we're, we have confidence in this that I haven't really talked too much about is that we're seeing very consistent. Number one, we're seeing very consistent directions. The the reverse that we see is a rotated reverse, just like the normal is a rotated normal. So, so we, we expect that to be representing um, a polarity change, not some kind of present day alteration or something like that. Another thing uh, is if I look at, I didn't show this and it's a, in very poor quality, but uh, regionally we see very similar directions. So, so the behavior is often very similar between samples that are only 10 to 15 meters apart. 
Uh, so, so that's not really due to alteration. Um, and then again, the consistency of what we're seeing here uh, implies that there's something going on. The one thing that somebody had brought up before was saying maybe there could have been reheating happening that could cause something in this reversal. But to me, again, the, the, if there was reheating after the opening of the deep, we would not see this rotated direction. Yeah. And if it was happening during it, it would have had to be something, it's, it can't be a dike. A dike is only uh, going to be within a small region. It, it, we're seeing consistency across a kilometer of, of sampling. So it, if it's reheating, it has to be something that's, that's over a kilometer wide. And we don't see anything in the petrology that, that implies there's any kind of alteration happening. Yeah, okay. So I have another question about the slow, uh, slow clean, clean rate. Uh, what do you think, uh, which factor controlling the cooling rate in the uh, crust flow? Uh, is this slow cooling rate is general or normal in uh, cross flow? Across flow. Um, so the cooling rate, I, it, it is a little difficult to kind of compare cooling rates, um, yeah. especially because of the temperature regime that's ha that uh, magnetics exists in, right? I can make a, I've actually, that's something I'm working on now is taking these multi-component samples and using them to determine a magnetic cooling rate. Um, and that magnetic cooling rate is actually very consistent with a conductive cooling rate. Uh, so in that sense, I, I have some information, but it, it, you can't really compare it with things like um, geochemical samples mm -hmm. because those are, those are looking at temperature regimes that are, uh, a thousand to to seven hundred degrees C, which is well above what what uh, the magnetic samples can record. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I do have a figure uh, about the conductive cooling at some point if you want to. <laughs> <talk about. laughs> okay. Uh, that's good. So next question, please. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Sarah. Uh, it's really cool work. I I have a question uh, about the determination of the uh, the temperature. So you see that uh, there was a transition uh, around something like 500, 500 degrees C. And how do you define it from, do you define it from the demilitation curve? Yeah, so are you talking about how I decided that this, uh, this was about, sorry, the, this, this was about 500 degrees C? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so for that one, we were, specifically looking at things that have normal with a reverse overprint. And so that's depending on what, I, what I'm calling like the breakpoint temperature, which is the temperature uh, that you can identify where it's transitioning from normal to reverse. Okay. And, and so for example, this one I've identified, this is the point where it's happening and that's 530 degrees C. Okay. Um, so one more question. So what is the domain state of the magnetic carrier within the graph? SD or SD or MD or TFD, something like that? Single domain. Yeah, they look okay, pretty much domain. like pure magnetite. Okay. Yeah. So have you ever considered the, the SD, the new SD domain theory? Because here the temperature yeah. is defined in that. And then in the, in the, uh, in the rock, during when the rock was cooling down, it's nothing for much longer time. Yes. So actually, yeah, the temperature should be uh, lower than yes. the, the turning point uh, in the demarcation curve. Right, right, yeah. 100%. Yeah, okay. you guys are both, you're bringing up these great points. Yeah, so I, I talked about it and I, I didn't bring it up, but there is some work that I'm doing about it, right? But you're 100% correct. Okay. Things that yeah, are yeah. 100, 500 degrees that I'm recording in the lab, 530 okay. degrees are that's, closer that's to about... Yeah. I, I didn't get all that. I was not here for all the time. So I glossed, I glossed over it, but you're 100% yeah. correct. Yeah, I did use some polya theory to, to determine 
that that was supposed to be around 500. But I didn't okay. do it as much for that paper. But you're you're exactly correct. And where is some? This is that cooling rate I was talking about earlier. It does look like this is um, representative of cooling rates in degrees per year based on our, on these samples. But yeah. Yeah, that's great to know. Thank you. Yeah. Good question. Oop. Did I freeze? Did I lose you guys? I feel like I'm lost. Hi. Hi. I, I have a question for you. Uh, do you think the slow slow cooling rate of the Gabriel uh, could impact the marine magnetic anomalies? Sorry, could you say that one more time? It could affect what the. Uh, do you think the uh, slow sl slow cooling rate of the Gabriel, the lower crust, could impact the marine uh, magnetic anomalies? Oh. Oh yeah, so in terms of the slow cooling and the magnetic anomaly pattern that we're seeing? Yeah. Yeah, I actually had done some work um, on that before because you can see it in this picture, I think best. Uh, oh, sorry, away from current slide, there we go. Um, if you if there's this gabroic layer and, and very steep, um, it depends on the contribution of the mag of the gabrolic layer. I, I yeah. guess is what we're saying. And uh, depending on, so I did a previous paper in 2020 that uh, kind of assigned the um, or tried to determine from these sur magnetic surveys what the um, magnetization remnants magnetization should be, and the gabrolic layer looks like it's about 1.2 amps per meter which is um, higher than some people expected, but it's still pretty low in terms of contributions compared to the dikes and gabbros. And when I did some modeling of it, you, you can't really see the, the gabroic contribution as much as, as this. You, you, do see, you would expect to see the anomaly differ a little bit, but you don't, you don't see it as much as you might expect. And you would need it to be this kind of idealized scenario like fast spread crust versus um, any kind of slow spread crust or, or intermediate spread. Oh, oh, okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. And, and I can pull up, uh, it's in, it's in a 2020 paper I did. They have a, a figure of the differing anomaly pattern based on if you have fast spread or slow spread or not fast spread, uh, sheeted cells or Gabbro glacier. Okay. Uh, generally the uh, pinot lava was, uh, was uh, sort of to be the most, uh, mostly contributed to the uh, uh, marine magnetic anomalies. Yeah, and I would, I would say that that's what ours showed too, is it, depending on how much, uh, using the contributions that we estimated from, from our, our survey, um, it still looks that way. The pillow lavas are always going to kind of dominate the signal that you're seeing. Oh, okay, okay. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else have questions? I think that we might have. Hi, Sarah. Hi. I'm Shu Hui. Shu Hui. Yeah. <laughs> nice to meet you again. Nice to meet you. So I must say congratulations to you about this beautiful work from oh, the sampling, you. especially the orientation and the careful exper experimental measurement and the reasonable ex explanation. It's really a beautiful job. Oh, thank um, you. So I, I, I just have a, a small question mm -hmm. because I, I don't work on like um, 
let's see, surface of sea crystal. So I, I don't quite understand. Uh, could you go to the, the slide about um, the three dimensional uh, section about area A or B? I remember you, you have a slide. Something three dimensional. Yeah, showing the. the oh, 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 yeah, like this one? Uh, maybe former. Oh, yeah, this one. Okay, sorry. I keep going around. This one. And next, yeah, this one. Okay. <laughs> so, yeah, so the top layer is uh, point to normal. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the second reversal layer should be two point reversal, right? Oh, no, 2.1, a point one reversal layer, right? Mm -hmm. Oh, wait. Uh, because I read your paper carefully. Yeah. You didn't show it on your slide, but it's. Uh, yeah, I think they made me modify it later. Um, but this one, right? The, the, yeah. Yeah. So it's. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So as far as I know, two point, uh, a point two normal is, it should be older than a point one reversal, right? Right. So why the older layers are on top of the younger layers? I right. have no idea about. Uh, it took me so long to understand the idea, right? But the idea is that things are cooling very quickly in the lavas and dikes. So, mm -hmm. so you, you've recorded that early and then things are remaining hot under in the gabroic section for a long time period. And so in this example, you don't start cooling until you're six kilometers off axis. So you're really, the younger thing isn't recording until much, much later, or sorry, does that make sense? Um, okay. Essentially, it, it's locked in the top, and then you have to wait a long time to cool the bottom. Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah, because I, I see this, uh, this case, this situation also in area B, so the younger. Right. right. Uh, so the, so the lavas and dikes will lock in much, much earlier. And then a long time period. So six kilometers of offset that rep represents, I think, uh, uh, a little less than a hundred million years here. It has to essentially stay hot for, or sorry, a hundred thousand years, hundred thousand years, 0.1 million years um, before it can start cooling. Okay, just because they cool later. Yeah at deeper depths yeah 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 so it's it's stay it's cold on the top it's like a cold cap and then mm -hmm. thing it takes a really long time for that to cool down and so you're much further off axis before you can actually start cooling in the okay. gap layer yeah okay got it and another question is um so you have some specimens they are single component right right uh, both single reversal or normal component. Mm -hmm. uh, so I see your explanation for this is because uh, uh, they have a very, very narrow high temperature range of uh, record capacity. Uh, so my question is, uh, do you have other rock map results to support this? Um, Jeff, Did Jeff is in a rock map. Yeah, um, so we've done a lot of rock mag in terms of, uh, that I haven't really shown. Um, I think I'm trying to find the median destructive temperature ones that we have, but there's a distinct, uh, it really doesn't seem that there's a lot of unblocking below 500 degrees C for, for many of these samples. Where is this picture? I know I have one. <laughs> um, <laughs> But in general, so like our median destructive temperature seems to show that there isn't that much. And then I guess it's in my actual thesis, not in not in the presentation. Um, so there's that. And then we have these, um, I we did some PTRM studies mm -hmm. and there, a lot of them seem to show that they don't really start unblocking. Uh, that's a bad example, but there, there, a lot of them do seem to show that there isn't much unblocking at certain um, temperature states. So where's that one? Yeah. Uh, but it does seem to give confidence that they do have the ability to record multi-components 
mm-hmm. for some of them. And, mm-hmm. and I think we're still trying to kind of revise whether, whether it's this narrow and blocking temperature or maybe there was um, maybe uh, some kind of change in the field. But I, I, think, I think overall, I, I think it's, it's pretty compelling that, that the unblocking range, temperature range seems to be very small, but I, I don't have that <laughs> figure right now. <laughs> Okay. Okay. Got it. Yeah. Anyway, so congratulations again. So yeah, that is good very to good. You. Work. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I think I'm back on the internet. Uh, okay. Thanks everyone for your participation and uh, uh, thanks to Sarah again. Uh, have a good week. Have a good day. Bye bye. Thanks, guys.